people move into the concept that actually they have some agency if they are not the problem that they are here and their career problems separated from them then it sort of quite naturally comes about that they move into the idea that you know they they have got some power some agency to influence what happens next and what about rewinding the narrative then and pivoting to a new storyline that actually serves them Welcome back to the Career Therapy Podcast, where we help professionals of all ages stress less in their job search, earn more in their careers, and figure out exactly what they want to be when they grow up. My name is Martin McGovern, founder and lead coach here at Career Therapy, and I'm excited to introduce our guest today. Please welcome Helen Hannison to the podcast. Helen is a leadership coach, narrative therapist, writer, and speaker based in the UK. A former director of some of the world's largest PR companies, today Helen helps seasoned professionals who are at a career crossroads make a fresh plan and realign their work. In our conversation today, we discuss how rewriting your personal narrative can help improve your career, what you need to do to align your values with your work, and how to build transformative resilience throughout your life. If you like this episode, be sure to follow Helen on LinkedIn and join her community at HelenHannison.com, as well as leaving us a review for the podcast on iTunes. This truly helps us be able to continue to curate these conversations for you and help you in your job search. So without further ado, here's my convo with Helen. Enjoy. I've got our sort of tentative title here listed as How Your Narrative Shapes Your Career. Um, and you know, I've got my notes from our last convo, but has there been anything going on on your side that's been interesting lately? That's been sort of, you know, capturing your attention. The thing that is coming through, I'm just trying to think now about the couple of workshops I've done and, you know, always there's a little influx of clients from them is the common thing is, or the common question that comes up for me is how do people know what they think they know? Because those are the stories that hold them stuck. They feel so true that they have that power. And a lot of the coaching, certainly at the beginning, even in a clarity conversation is about breaking down that belief that what they think they know is, is, you know, actually true and somehow has that ability to influence and shape what they do next um yeah so I think it all ties in yeah. I, I do find you know it was all very circular <laughs> you know yeah. what I do at this point I think I'm just attracting the same people or the same career problem you know which is no bad thing but yeah that's been really noticeable particularly with older more seasoned professionals as I would call them established careerists they really believe they're stuck in a success trap they their sort of expiry date is coming up and you know it's also too late for them to make change happen and that that feels like another one of those what I would call a false belief that needs to be reframed so when you're working with your clients in that success sort of mindset what are some of the things that they're dealing with the most I think there's there's a sort of learnt hopelessness, I think, that the job search just exasperates, sort of sending things off to the ether and going on some treasure hunt to find an actual human to check in with. You, you know, it's really off-putting because that thing that people say they don't like about networking, actually they're comfortable with selling if they can do it through rapport building but they're not allowed, they're not able to. So that, I think that's probably the biggest block at the beginning. I do think the paper presentation is enormous. It's enough to hold my clients stuck for, you know, months unless I, I sort of, the minute I spot it, we, we farm it out and get it off their plate. Um, and it, it's not coming from a place of, you know, not knowing what they want next. But I do think it's really, really an important thread to connect the dots between all the work that we've done by the, at this point to understand, you know, what do you need to align with um, to really thrive, not, not just get the next job, 
to really make a meaningful career change? And why would your paper profile still present your old self? Because otherwise you're you're going to there's there's a just very really big disconnect between your ambitions to thrive and you know what you're actually pursuing in real terms. So it, it's making that have more synergy. Um, and I think though those are the big traps. And then I think it's the the slightly more left field things actually. So I will often ask clients, as well as a traditional job search, to reach out um, on email. So not in an advertised way, but to reach out to the people they know. So look for people, not jobs. Um, and just be very authentic and honest about I'm looking to make a professional pivot. I'm not happy doing what I'm doing, although I appreciate from the outside it looks, you know, pretty good. It is it's really hard to to be in this position. And I, what I know now I want for myself is X or Y. Is there any anyone who you know, can help me or sort of introduce me to connects of theirs who are perhaps where I wish I could go so that I can collect some stories about those career pathways. And I sort of, you know, that that opens a lot up. And I have to be honest, that non-traditional way of sort of asking the world for what you need seems really to help. Yeah, I really love that. I've actually always called it the reverse job search, starting with people and working backwards to the roles. So I, I love how you're saying that. And it kind of reminds me when you say your story is representing your past, not your future. Um, oh, did I lose it? There you are. Um, when when we're talking about our story representing our past, not our future, um, just to use you know a famous person as an example, right? Elon Musk isn't still out there talking about how he built PayPal, right? <laughs> He's talking about how he's building SpaceX and what he wants to do in the future and what he's going to do with electric cars, right? If he was still yeah. like, so I built PayPal back in the night in the early 2000s, and we'd be like, who cares, man, right? But people are interested in his story because he's talking about the future. And, you know, people have problems with Elon Musk, that, that all aside, I'm just talking about the storytelling aspect of it. So uh, when, when you're talking with people and they're kind of stuck in the past, what what do you think that is like what's where are they trapped in their head that they're stuck in the past it's so interesting there is always absolutely without deviation there is always a particular story in their narrative in the past not necessarily their professional past sometimes way back in their childhood there is a voice that is commentating to them based on that very previous event so it feels like it has enough of a nugget of truth enough sort of resonance to map onto what they're experiencing today and so they believe it and they've completely lost memory or track of where that story began from so it just comes for them and it feels sort of inevitable that therefore they also know where that's going to take them and it's going to take them to an unwanted result. So it, it's it's raising those, those inner critics are dialing up because they still feel like it's their job to protect them from, you know, failure or a setback or, you know, shame of, you know, whatever it was back then. So it, it's that pattern, that old out of date pattern that has long since expired, but is still entrenched. Um, and that's what's going on. So it's about separating the person from their career problem um, by unpacking that, which, which is where the narrative therapy really comes in and, and helps. Yeah, and it really is an actual loop, right? Like they have the story and they have the words down. I remember I was talking to someone once and they were like, here's the problem I'm having. And they laid it out word for word. They just like, just laid out this whole scenario of, you know, here's where I've been successful, here's where I've not been successful, here's why, and so on and so forth. And they kind of just, you know, let let all of their things out in this conversation I was having. And then three weeks later or a month later, I was sitting down with them again and they go, this is what's going on. And they almost verbatim said the exact same story word for word. And I was like, are you reading from a script? Did you write this down? This is crazy. Like, your your internal monologue is it's not just like happening it's it's repeating a script do you sort of see it in that level of specificity 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I talk a lot about people getting stuck in their stories and what you've just um, described is exactly what I mean. People get stuck in an open loop of the same story again and again. And that's how they get stuck as well in a cycle of trying to solve the same career problem over and over again on their own. Right. You, you know, they they can make situational change happen. But what they're not understanding is what is the the right problem to solve, actually. So they achieve the change and then look around and think, well, the cast of characters changed, but actually the problem is still the problem. I didn't, I didn't actually achieve much. So it's really important. And, and this is where the narrative therapy is brilliant for unpacking that because you can sort of challenge actually the narrative and say well why why do we know this you know let's look for some evidence that this very pessimistic pathway you feel like you're on or you're interpreting has just happened one isn't pervasive it's not permanent it's not inevitable and and by separating in that way people move into the concept that actually they have some agency if they are not the problem, that they are here and their career problems separated from them, then it sort of quite naturally comes about that they move into the idea that, you know, they, they have got some power, some agency to influence what happens next. And what about rewinding the narrative then and pivoting to a new storyline that actually serves them? And that's where you can start to get people, not, not to reframe, which is slightly different, but to actually pivot. So understand the link between what you think how you behave and the outcomes you attract and that therefore if you do pivot to a new storyline the next time you recognize that pattern then you will change your behavior you've already thought through you know with support what what you wish you would do or say or you know act on and get a notice you know let's point at that evidence you then get a different result the one that you actually want and that can become your new storyline so it's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's incredible, especially because, you know, again, I was reminded this week how much of this is mental, right? It's not the tactics. It's not job boards. It's not your resume and your cover letter and all these individual things that people will spend incredible amounts of money. I've seen, I've heard people spend like $850 on a resume and I'm like, but you're too scared to network. So that's not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, you've got these situations where, um, you know, we we so focus on these external factors. Right. And I love that you're sort of allowing people to break away their identity from their job a little bit, because um, the story in our head becomes so critical. I actually speaking of the kind of how much of this is mental. Um, I have a student right now who is the most driven, you know, has multiple interviews this week, is just like, I'm going to get up, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to double it kind of mentality. And the only reason they're still job searching right now is because they got into an accident uh, while building a set of stairs and had a, an injury that uh, lost a couple fingers. And, you know, <gasps> you would think, right, it's like pretty, pretty crazy when I heard the story, I was like, what happened? <laughs> I was like, this is a real left turn in the call. But it was one of those things where like, the way they talked about it, they're like, so that happened. And now I'm moving forward, like, and now I've recovered. And now I'm back to the search. And I really want to get a job. And like, here's what I'm doing. And here's where I'm at. And I'm like, and then the next call I have is someone who's like, I don't know if I can reach out to that person to network. And it's like, it's so crazy how different the how different our actions are just based on how we think about a thing, right? Like in his case, he's had an actual physical injury that's gotten in the way of the job search, yet he's still driven, motivated and getting interviews. And someone else might have nothing, no blockers in front of them, no physical things that are getting in the way, no people, no injuries, nothing. But this is stopping them, right? Yeah. And what are some of the common stories that you hear going through people's heads that paralyze them? I think the one of the really common ones I hear is I, I think it's too late. And these are my seasoned professionals usually who have been, you know, definitely in their career for 20 plus years. They might even sometimes have been at one company for something approaching that. And they really believe, I mean, to your earlier point, 
they really believe that the job does define them, not just the career, that role in that corporate home is what defines them. So they're very, very tied almost, you know, to a toxic, I don't, I always want to use the language of abuse, you know, it's not healthy for them in this place, they, they feel they're not valued. Um, there's possibly some ageism somewhere, you know, going on that they, they feel victim of. And yet, trying to get them to sort of open their mindset to more of a agile career mindset to to move into career redesign and and look at all the transferable benefits they could bring from that wealth of experience to another company at least but possibly sector you know possibly something solopreneurial entrepreneurial you know there there is so many ways to portfolio career um non-exec roles i mean you know there's it's endless to me it's endless trying to get them to move into that concept is is particularly hard and i think we're in the realm here of transformative um resilience you know and you know your your story about the guy who i mean literally lost some fingers oh my wow um but was focused i mean to me i think that in in therapy, they talk quite often about resilience being almost like the the level, the surface level of, of the water that you're the boat floating along. And it's it's not really about whether you encounter obstacles under the surface. You will, we all will. It's how much we have in terms of resources to cope with that. And that's the answer to, you know, do setbacks actually set us back? And I think that is is really, really key. Um, I think the other story I notice is for people who have been made redundant. And I think I really, I mean, my heart just goes out to them every time. It, you know, they're, they're reeling from what I call career grief and they're in no place to be redesigning their career and trying to be excited about anything at all because they can't even see how they would turn the page, let alone rewrite the next chapter. And I think that's another one of those stories that can trap us you know we've been rejected from that thing we do that you're quite right too many people feel they're defined by that thing they do and the truth is we're all more than the work we do and there is always another chapter so long as you turn the page you, you don't have to know what's on the page you just have to be doing doing that piece the active piece so it's I think those are the two real absolute standouts for me. But I think you're right that the common theme is, is you know, it's kind of like a fill in the gaps for people, isn't it? <laughs> it's a, yeah. Everyone's got their own one, They, you know. Well, and, and I like what you said earlier where it's like, you know, you might change your job, but you haven't changed your perspective or the, your, your process or your story or anything. So you're just in the mm. same problem in a new place, right? Wherever we go, we bring ourselves with us, right? So until we actually start <laughs> addressing our our view of our career, we're not going to, even if we change companies, we're not going to quote unquote, solve anything. And um, just really quick uh, for any American listeners who don't know uh, being made redundant, is is that the same as laid off or? Yes, um, Okay. yes, sorry, it is, yeah. I heard it on The <laughs> Office and I was like, is that about is that layoff or is like <laughs> I hadn't heard it before so um and yeah when I, I do a lot of writing and I forget I always sort of swap out the terminologies but yeah what, <laughs> it's sorry that's wonderful I actually love it it's a much nicer word um but there's uh there's this idea here and um you mentioned career grief and this mm. is actually an episode that I'm going to be doing in uh a, a month or two where I'm having a grief, a grief counselor come on to talk about like the stages of grief with a layoff. And um, I'm not as well versed in that, but uh, when it comes to losing a job and being made redundant, I think there's, there's a real loss of multiple things. I think people mostly think about it as a loss of financial security. Oh, I lost my job and I'm, I'm struck, like now I got to think about finances. But it's way more than that. It's, you know, the, the, your reputation is quite often mm -hmm. tied up in your company, right? Oh, I work at Goldman Sachs or I work at Google or whatever the thing might be. And you like yeah. get a real sense of identity from that. Um, 
your identity is lost or your reputation is lost with the company, your identity is lost with the job title. I'm a director of marketing or I'm a project manager. I'm a consultant. Like that is who you are, especially in, in American society where it's just like the first question you're always asked is what do you do? Right. And, and then you also have the financial insecurity. So it's like you lose three massive pillars of personality in a way. And yeah, and so I love what you're saying about like separating your identity from your job. What are some of the ways that you've seen people actually successfully do that? It's all about alignment. I think it's it's what I call career clarity. This is where on my coaching ladder, we we always start no matter what door someone's come through. Because I think it's getting to know yourself and what you need to align with to achieve your ambitions to thrive that you know has to happen before you start making any plan because what are you planning to align with you you need to you know unpack that bit right so it's we go through a process that i sort of say oh, we're, we're creating our career compass at this point so it feels quite internal looking some people occasionally struggle to sort of slow down they want to fire straight into the you know problem solving mode um but it's really really important so we look at strengths and that one I find people are generally reasonably fluent at, not always comfortable to own those things other people have affirmed them for, but they're aware because they've been promoted for them or trained in them or, you know, they've had feedback around them right through their career and, and further back. But we then look at the weakness within those strengths and think of it a bit like a coin, you know, they have a shadow side, <laughs> you know, what's on the other side, because sometimes you know, perseverance is really common. Um, and that can be great. But if that is the piece that is driving you to the point that you're not recognizing when actually, you don't need to be sticking, you need to pivot, you need to change, you need to leave, you need to quit, you, you know, then, then actually, it's not doing you any favors. So that's, that's really important just to draw that distinction. And we start noticing we're back to the saboteurs or the stories that hold us stuck at that point, right. And then we look at values. That's harder work, because they operate under the consciousness. So that that is harder for people. So we, you know, we spend quite a bit of time not just unpacking what those are, because I think if you ask people, they come out with a nice list of socially desirable values, but that they don't actually necessarily live to or use to make their hard choices when they show up. So we look at how to activate the values, just, just the top two. And then we look at the synergy. What If you think of it like a Venn diagram, one strengths here and values here and move them together, you know, what is living in that sweet spot of synergy, as I call it, you know, that bit in the middle, where do your values and strengths overlap? Because actually, if you think of strengths as the fuel that goes in the tank, the, the stuff that no plan is robust with, you know, unless they have those, but values of the destination, that, that sort of tells you where you need to be headed, what, what it is you need to be, you can't not have what you stand for. So that's, that's more about pointing where you need to go. And unless you understand that and the difference, it's incredibly hard to make meaningful career change. So that for me is the most important work actually that we we do um, in in my coaching ladder. Um, and then we wrap it all up with purpose. So I often talk about careering on purpose. So it's not just doing work that you're competent at again, all those strengths need to be there. It's what's meaningful to you. What makes you have that kind of aliveness and alignment that you, you just feel completely mission driven to be doing that work and look forward to it on a Sunday when you have a look at your diary and see what's coming up next week. And that, you know, that kind of stuff, it's, it's really, really critical to me that, that that's the kind of career change I'm helping people achieve. Yeah. That, that switch from the Sunday scaries to, to something that you actually are looking forward to is big. I like how you said that this, your strengths are the gas and your values are the destination. Um, and I, I want to clarify a little bit the difference between answering the strengths and weaknesses question in an interview 
and understanding your strengths and weaknesses on a personal level. Uh, they're not necessarily the same thing, right? No, it's a really good point. So career one for me was public relations and um, that's probably better known as the art of spin. And I tend to think really when we're in an active job search situation and you're, you know, you're into active, you know, interviews, and you're, it's all about self-presentation and impression management. So of course, as much as we work to unpack all this stuff, it's not necessarily what you wave around on your CV or what you speak to. That becomes a different stage towards the end of the career redesign, where now you know what you're pursuing in terms of the, the kind of role or sector or, you know, change that you're after. And then you're maybe looking at the skills that you've accrued so far, the experience and understanding, well, what's the transferable benefit to another kind of company or a different sector? Or how do I get elevated in this sector I am in and want to stay in? You know, what is that? And actually, that's what you speak to, that stuff. You start telling stories, as in not fake, but you anecdotally build the picture for the people that you're talking to about how that scope of work back then means that you now have the particular skill set that they would benefit from in their project or you know area of work so no the the self disclosure i would call it is is a different thing and again needs to be considered it's all about our choices yeah and that again plays into our stories right like um, the typical thing I'll hear someone say in an interview, in a mock interview is my weakness is that I procrastinate. And I always go, well, who hasn't? Like, uh, whether it's going to the gym or eating well, like everyone's procrastinating something, right? So that's not really what they're asking, right? They're asking something a little more practical, like what should we, what work should we assign you and not assign you in a way? And, and thinking about these stories that we tell, I, I like that you brought up that kind of there's the personal narrative and then there's the public narrative and this sort of plays into personal brand and professional brand or knowing thyself versus selling thyself right and yeah I'm and I'm glad you said it that way actually because I tend to think there aren't hard lines between our personal self and our professional self we're all one person and then that gets very confusing but I mean that in the sense of career life synergy you know you can't go and do work that you just loathe you know or for people that you find toxic and depleting because that isn't tenable in the end it's a different thing from saying you know I yeah know thyself as you just said it you know I do think the kind of work I'm talking about with the career compass is comes under the banner of self-expertise that's for you to know that that's that's your inner core it's what drives you and motivates you and then there's therefore an outer layer and that's the one that you help other people get to know I love that and and you mentioned earlier you said um, people keep trying to solve the same problem over and over in their careers do you have any examples of that and maybe someone who was able to switch that narrative in their head yeah, I really do. <laughs> There's, um, I'm thinking of a lovely, lovely client of mine um, at the moment who has absolutely been guilty in the past of solving the same career problem. For her, I'm, I'm going to tell you her story backwards, actually, so that you, you don't, it's not a big drum roll as we go through, but Love it. for her, the the actual problem, the right problem to solve, as, as I call it, is um, managing up. Um, there's something really important about influencing up, speaking out, that kind of thing. So without knowing that, uh, without buying into that, she, let's call her Louisa, that's not her real name, but Louisa um, felt that what the problem she had to solve was moving to a smaller corporate environment where she would get to be part of leadership herself. She wanted to be part of helping the business develop. She wanted to be part of building a people first culture. So, you know, these are all things that her career trajectory supported and she, she got that role. And then she discovered that her new boss, her CEO, um, 
you know, had some bad beha- boss behaviors going on. And it, it takes a little while for that stuff to show up. And it wasn't until then that she fell into her old pattern of being extremely clear that important values were being violated in the way that this guy was um, abusing his position as leadership. I mean, nothing nothing physical or too untoward, but, but really a bit bullying, you know, not at all the kind of people first culture she'd come to be part of. But instead of speak up, and she sort of spoke up in the moment, so she, she thought she'd solved it, and I think this is this is what I mean by the, the nuance in solving the right problem or solving the same problem again and again because you haven't recognized what that is shows up. She spoke up and defended the team member extremely well, like a mother bear. She did that. Her, she got the full support of her whole team for it. Um, and she was quite new in. So this was this was all, you know, good stuff. She felt hopeful that she had demonstrated leadership and would have earned respect from the boss as well. But then what happened was she separated entirely from the relationship. There was a business trip, to be fair, but the contact the contact just went. Because what happens when we are faced with really difficult discussions about what matters most, conflict scenarios, we don't want to go back in. It's quite aversive. So we hold ourselves back and that actually it makes it harder to, to go back in and, and, you know, press go again. We, we need to talk about what happened. How would we manage that if it shows up again? What was it you were actually reacting to? How would we work around that? Because I feel that that violated this particular um, way of, of working, a kind of career commandment. So we let, let's explore that together and work it out as a partnership. All becomes very difficult, very, very difficult. And that's where we start narrating new stories. So by the time she came back from the business trip, the new stories were really quite elaborated. You know, he, I'm probably going to have to leave. I probably shouldn't have said this and should have said the other. I don't think I can work with him at all. I just don't know. And, you know, actually persuading um, and coaching someone through the process to prepare themselves well, to have, you know, a difficult discussion, a crucial conversation in that kind of backdrop was very, very hard but it mapped on to the same experience at the place before and listening to her career path before we'd met before that too. Um, If you don't ask for what you need, the likelihood is it is you, you won't get it. If you do, and you learn to take a deep breath and construct those coactive conversations, you, you have a good chance. And even if you don't, You've got really accurate, much more informed information to make your next decision on. And that is the kind of thing I mean by make sure you're solving the right problem. And it really is that difference between trying to figure everything out before doing something and getting better at responding to what's happening. I see this uh, in a more practical sense in interviews. Um, where someone will be like, I need to prepare everything perfectly before this interview to prevent anything from going wrong. And I find that to be so much the opposite of what we need to do. We need to get better at responding when things inevitably go wrong so that we can be resilient in that way, right? Like something is always going to go wrong. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it's true. It's so it's kind of naive, isn't it? I don't know why we hope that life will be a nice, smooth, linear trajectory when there's so much evidence that it just isn't that. And there's, um, I often talk about zigzag careers. It's, you know, it's the agile career mindset in that sense. It's sort of accepting. If you think of your career as a series of mini projects, and ideally interest-based mini projects, then actually you're always thinking about, well, what am I most interested in from this role? Because it's clear it's not that bit, or what do I not enjoy? And it's the same with this thing of reacting to things, to setbacks, to fails, to you know, difficult conversations. 
if you know your values and you've done the work to understand what that actually means, how do you honor them? How do you protect them? How do you notice the triggers when they're violated? Then you are better placed to say quite calmly and confidently, I I'm, I've got to challenge that. I, I really have a problem believing that X is the right approach or whatever it is. And you know, it takes enormous self-awareness, which is why we start with that stuff, actually. Um, because it, after that, we're into design thinking and a bit of education about, you know, we don't actually need to know the final destination in order to take, start off on the right direction. That, that's the analogy of the compass. We, we do need to know we're going the right direction and what that is and what that isn't. Um, and that, that's a slightly different perspective. And I think from there, you can talk about building forwards. So it's one small safe step at a time. So by the time you're making transformation happen, actually it's quite aligned and confident change that you're acting on because it's, it's happened through a series of micro steps actually. Yeah, and that, that shift is huge, right? Because um, almost everyone that I encounter starts with the destination and then says, how do I get there? And, mm -hmm. you know, we have processes for that, sure. Um, and I've, I've even done that in my career. One of my first career shifts was to get into advertising. And I was like, I really want to be in advertising because I think it's this kind of creative place and blah, blah, blah. And I worked to get to that spot only to realize when I got there, wait, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And this isn't at all what I thought I was going to be doing. And, and just sort of realizing that, you know, to this whole storytelling point is that we don't really know what we want a lot of the time. Um, and so we're making these judgments based on an article that said um, coding jobs pay well or some arbitrary thing. And then you get into the process and, and you're not on the right track. And I feel like where people get really caught up is saying, I need this outcome and I'm not getting this outcome and nothing is working. And we as coaches are like, well, wait a second. How about you open up the types of outcomes that you're open to because it's preventing you from doing all these great things that could be directionally correct? What do you, where do yeah. you see it going? I think you're completely right. It's it's about, and this is why I talk about redesigning your career because that starts from a place of, you know, what I mean, what are you trying to solve? And it removes this idea that there is one true pathway to achieve it, which is kind of what you're talking about. Let, you know, I want that kind of job that that's the defined vision. And it takes it away and says, you know, how many careers do you feel like you have in you? And forcing people to engage with some creative processes. And, you know, people will usually come up with at least three, if not four or five different careers that they could pursue you know if you give them scenarios and it doesn't really matter what content is in those to be honest it's the mindset shift it's that reframing that false belief that there is this one true pathway and you know I think the danger of that kind of thinking and choosing the kind of job that you want to go for and just shooting for that regardless is that if you're not on your one true pathway you've already decided that that's a fail you failed and if you're in a job that you had to take for practical reasons, but it isn't that true pathway, then everybody you meet is not the right people. You're not in the right company. So you're not networking. You're not showing your best self. You're not trying as hard as you should because perhaps it's transitional for you while you look for the one true pathway again. And, you, you know, it, you can go on for entire careers that way. So I think what I try and do, and I, I think this is the framework we're offering your audience um, a bit later actually is pay attention to the regrets that you have use your memory system to help guide you with some you know better compass information about what resonates what works what feels the right on point direction and and look for those bumps in the roads actually pay attention to them because that's telling you something important about why. May not, it may not come out with a job description, but it, it certainly tells you, you know, why does this matter? 
what why is that aspirational that job that you want in advertising and and I think you, you know you're probably beginning to get there with well it it was creative and you kind of fancy the buzz of that you see yourself with that that membership but you know if you keep asking why 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 maybe six or so times eventually you get to something a bit deeper and you know I mean I, I can't guess what that would be but it was really interesting to watch people get to the again the core of what what you really need as well as what you bring which is where people usually start what skills do they bring because that's easier yeah and there's um there's a lot of you know I think a lot of people get scared when they start that process because it is so open-ended because it is so uh you know unknown right um and I think as career coaches I'm you know I I, I don't want to speak too much by your experience but you know, most career coaches, this wasn't the first job that they chose, right? It was like they had a career and then they're like, wait a second, I'm finding a draw to this area. And in my case in particular, I was doing a podcast outside of my job with uh, Raj, who introduced you and I, which is so funny uh -huh. how it all keeps coming full circle, right? And while we were doing that podcast, we met someone, we interviewed someone who worked at uh, the Daily Muse. And then that turned into being invited onto a platform to be a coach. And we were like, whoa, we went from like marketing brand coaches to career coaches. That's an interesting shift. And then all of a sudden this whole new world opened up of education and career development and professional. And it's just like, I thought at this point I'd be, you know, senior level at an ad agency when all I did was just pursue interesting things and all of a sudden whole new careers that I never would have thought of opened up. And I think that's where people miss out in their careers is that they they think it's like these four options. They, they could be a doctor, a lawyer, a marketer, or, or an entrepreneur, and there's nothing else out there when in reality, there are so many different ways to live your career. And so um, it's kind of cool to work with a coach like you who's you know, had changes and, and has seen so many perspectives to be able to understand when we're getting kind of caught in that myopic mindset. Yeah, I think it's, it's really hard, but I recognize why, you know, there's in one part, there's going to be a pull, particularly for more established careerists to, um, you know, what makes their world go round. So there, there's a kind of obligation and responsibility, isn't there? And that, that, that's a bit of a trap. I, I call that one the success trap. You know, they, it looks kind of comfortable and successful from the outside, but inside maybe it feels more like being bankrupt of all meaning. So it, it is still, it's a luxury need, but you, you shouldn't just dis dismiss your needs even when they're luxury, you know, they're yours. But the other thing that I think is going on with that is sort of looking at any story at all in hindsight makes it sound like it was all a very smooth. We're back to this linear trajectory. Ah, oh, so you decided to leave, you know, PR and then you decided to, you know, investigate psychology and became a coach. Cool. And that's part of what makes it feel virtually impossible for anyone else to sort of work out not only what well, could I do that because I'm this age and that costs money and what about the other and but what if it's not literal what if they don't know what their version of that is what makes sense of career one and they they get to leverage it I almost think of sometimes we use our corporate powers for good you know what if you don't know what that is then you're you're just stuck wishing it but it is sort of like you need all, all the layer in the middle filled out. It's all all vague. So it's I think it's really that is the one pitfall of telling stories um, is that I, I do really hate the way it lands when when it actually puts people off. Because what we're talking about is just go and, you know, discover, have faith in yourself. Keep curious, keep following your interest and your curiosity um, I'm kind of allergic to, I don't know about you, but the sort of find your passion brigade, because I, I feel like we, we cultivate our passion and it probably takes about 10 years. There's no such thing as transformation overnight. It started as a little seedling of interest and not much more. And you just followed it and pursued it and, you know, kept, kept looking after it and see, see what it becomes when it's cultivated like that. I'm completely in the same boat. Yeah, I think the uh, 
positivity porn, <laughs> as I call it online sometimes. Um, it's just like, you know, it, it oversimplifies things down to a single, like you're supposed to just have a single passion when in reality you have thousands of passions or seeds of passions and you only have time to develop certain ones or you only have energy to develop certain ones. And most people will just never develop any of them. They'll go like 10% in each of them and then wonder why, you know, they're not figuring things mm. out instead of focusing. And I struggle with that too, but there's, um, there was something that we hit on, which I'm really curious to dive into a little bit more on. Uh, if someone were to try and start doing this work on their own, all right, they're, they haven't worked with a coach yet, but they're like, maybe my narrative isn't quite serving me. What would you recommend? Where would you recommend that they start the journey? It's a good question. And I think I would recommend they start by sort of unpacking that, that memory system, the meaning making is in there. Um, so we, we all attach meaning to our past events. It's what, you know, builds those stories. We, we tell ourselves some are good, some are not serving us, some, some are. So I think really just writing down perhaps every role you've ever had just on a piece of paper on one, one side of a piece of paper folded in half. So it's just a list, no detail whatsoever, no salary, no title, no people, just, just literally, you know, tracking. And then come to the other side of the paper and think about where were you in positive energy? Where were you enjoying it? Where were you, I mean, if you can get close to job joy, as I call it, great, draw a smiley face. But also where were you clock watching? Where were the days as long as a week? Where did you not last for very long and before you were looking for your next move? Because even if you didn't feel particularly unhappy or don't remember what that tipping point was, there's something to think about there. Often we look back, and this is this is why I've, I've put the nostalgia framework um, sort of for your audience, but, you know, we look back and we have regrets. We look back and wish we could get in a time machine and rewrite that bit. Because in hindsight, it's a little bit like what we were saying about the stories. In hindsight, you can look back at your own story and think, you know, I had two job offers at that point and I took that one, but I've always felt like the other one was unfinished business. And what was that about? What was it? Um, there's and, and start doing that, that why bubbling, you know, why, why, why with everything that you note on this second side of the page, because once you can work out what your past experience is trying to tell you, then you've got some really great guidance by the person who knows you best. It's sort of your wiser self is advising. And that is a fantastic start point to ideate from. So that, that would be my quick tip. I love it. And, and I just have one more pop into my head before we wrap up today. Um, there's a lot of folks that I work with who want to edit out parts of their story. Um, I had this career. I'm now in a boot camp or, you know, an MBA program, an educational program, coding, something like that. And it's unrelated to my last job. And I just want to pretend the last job never happened and start from scratch. And I find that that tends to be a detriment because it doesn't give the employer that they're interviewing with full insight into things, um, full understanding of like, oh, wait, you've worked with teams for five plus years. Like you do have some other skills. Um, and I and you were mentioning how looking back, everything kind of fits together sometimes. But sometimes people have a real hard time understanding that transition like understanding and and when i work with them we can usually tie those two things together in a, in a at least in a good story whether it's true or not we can get into the yeah. details but i'm curious like what are your thoughts or what would be your recommendations to people that just want to ignore pieces of their past yeah i'm on the same page as you i think it's it's a big mistake but it's really telling there is something hugely aversive going on for them and it's there's going to be a story there that they're telling themselves about their own failure i think we're into self-conscious emotions at this point it's how other people will perceive that career blip whatever the reason was i would encourage them to 
try and look at it from another perspective. So clearly they're, they're looking at it feeling, I don't know, shame, embarrassment, regret about whatever is going on wrapped up with that story. But if you sort of move yourself to a different pers perspective, a different position and look in at the same event, but thinking this time from the person who has appreciated you most in your career, and you have some sort of unconditional support there, some more compassionate support there, and look at it from that direction, and then try and unpack what came out of it. What were the learnings? What were the takeaways? Because otherwise we're just hiding. We're hiding from the, the sort of aversive thing we're a bit allergic to now. So what did that tell you? What did that you learn about yourself? You This environment does not work for you. That style of leadership, this... I worked with a medic once who, you know, how this kind of thing came up. And for her, we had to really work at unraveling well, what, what was difficult. It was the pressure of the ER that meant you're making life, you know, and death decisions sometimes on the hoof and the complete inability to spend proper time with the parents of the children. She was pediatric that, that she worked with. It didn't mean pediatrics wasn't right. She went into clinical and genetic research after that to actually hone in. So there's, it's always going to tell you something. And actually, I think it's more impressive for employers to hear, and particularly, you know, once in a career, you know, to be able to say, look, hands up, that didn't work for me. And here's why, and here's what I learned, and here's what I know about myself moving forwards. So you're... You just sort of, it's just an event. Failure isn't fatal. It's just an event. So you package it up in a box like that and take out what you need. And then you can throw the rest away, no problem. But avoiding it altogether, um, I, I think it can come, come back to bite you. And we're probably back into that same cycle of what is the problem you're trying to solve? You, you need to articulate what you must have and what you need as well as what you bring in that kind of scenario. Yeah. And I, there's two things there. It's, it's that learning, the thing you learned that's most important in any transition or in any conflict or in any, like, here's my strength and weakness. And here's what I've learned about myself by understanding that. That's mm -hmm. always the best piece. And I also like how you phrased failure is just an event. I feel like sometimes people go, again, with the internet and the memes and everything, it's like failure is success that you just haven't seen it's like no it's it's not always <laughs> like sometimes <laughs> failure is just an event but i like the neutrality of how you said that like i think so much of what um what's important about coaching is like not necessarily getting people to be blindly positive about stuff but getting people to just be neutral about stuff right like, yeah, it's about accepting, I think, isn't it? it? You know, we've got to accept and it'd be fascinating when you speak to your career grief person coming up because I, she, this is what they'll talk about, you know, isn't it? It's sort of, we go through so many stages before we get to acceptance. We, we feel shame, we feel shock, we feel angry, we oscillate between coping and processing with all of that and doing, you know, the supermarket shopping because that feels easy and normal and we hide. It's, it's all another version of hiding from this, this fail, this event that, that sort of really attacks our sense of, I can't say that, sense of self-worth, our self-esteem. And so what we need to do is recruit our self-compassion instead, because then we can be a bit kinder, which actually is quicker to restabilize ourselves and get back to whatever, you know, the task is going on, the job search or whatever. And that's really, I think, at the crux of it, that acceptance, because then it's, it is more neutral, it's in the past. And you can also look at the shadow side again, what came out of it. Um, it's not always positive, but it is always information and learning and useful to know. Helen, thank you so much for joining us today. This was absolutely wonderful. If people want to find out more about your work and, and hear about what you have to offer, where should they go? 
Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. It's um, helenhannison.com. That's my website. And it will soon be talking about um, a course, online course that I've packaged up my coaching ladder to deliver. So the thing to do would be to subscribe to the list that you'll see, um, I think, in the links um, or ask for the nostalgia upgrade will be another route into that. And you'll sort of be someone who then get those sort of actionable advice and articles and hear about careering on purpose. And could you give a little bit of uh, context on the nostalgia upgrade? Yes. Now, this was a framework that I developed to help my one-to-one clients recruit their memory systems. It was based actually on um, a trip that I did to New York, where we'd lived for a few years, but went back many years later. And it was was one of those things, locations, music, you know, all different things trigger our memories. And it was almost like walking into my past self because some quite acute things were going on. You know, career-wise, I'd been made redundant one time and the Brooklyn Bridge, we decided, you know, things that, you know, it it was, it was a bit like that. It was, it really, I could almost see a sort of in a movie where the screen would go wavy and (laughs) then you'd be back in the past in black and white or something so it it really got me thinking and I dug into the psychology because that's my background um of you know how do we utilize our memories because it really really feels like they're trying to tell you something and this is what the framework is all about to help you unpack your own memories and understand the meaning making system that is there for you so that you can employ it in a way that helps you shape your future focus and make these plans that we're talking about. What is the rewrite of the next career chapter when you don't know? So it's um, tapping into regrets and that kind of thing in a, in a really positive and actionable future focused way. I love that. And we, and that is a free framework for folks. So we'll have the link. Shared Absolutely. As well. Complimentary. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this episode today. I really appreciate your support of what we're building here at Career Therapy as we continue to try and explore the hidden side of modern work and tell some of the stories that maybe don't get enough light shed on them. If you enjoyed what you listened to today, I hope you will leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, Subscribe to this wherever you're listening or watching on YouTube, Spotify, etc. And uh, share this with some friends who you know are going through similar experiences and looking to build their career and, and gain some insights along the way. Again, thank you so much for stopping by, and I wish you the best. I'll see you on the next episode.